Um, in fact, uh, it took me three companies to figure this out. I wish I'd known this sooner. Like, if I had a time machine, if I can go back in time and talk to, uh, you know, if I can go back in time 20 years and talk to like a younger version of myself, uh, I would say, uh, let's say, dude, first of all, relax. Because in 20 years, you're going to have a time machine. <laughs> Was when 
everything was a meltdown. This was the financial crisis of 2008. Everything was a meltdown. Sequoia was sent around their memo to all their portfolio companies that shit's about to hit the fan and everyone needs to be depressed. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I frantically called everyone I knew to see if I could get anyone to give us some money uh, for about the next week. And no one would, no one would even uh, return my phone calls. Uh, and then we got two weeks of cash in the bank. Uh, and then I remember those, those days. We got two weeks of cash left. It was 3 a.m. And uh, I was just about to go to bed, and I decided, well, that's it. Uh, I'm going to go to sleep. Uh, I'm going to come in tomorrow morning, and uh, I'm going to shut down the company. I'm going to tell everyone that, well, we tried, but uh, we can't make it. We'll lay everyone off and shut down the company. Uh, because, you know, you only have two weeks of cash You can't literally go down to zero. You have to have enough to pay legal bills and that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, so I decided to do that, and uh, I remember thinking at the time, I remember thinking, like, uh, oh, um, this is what it must feel like to be an adult. I've never actually felt like an adult before, but this is what it must feel like, like making tough decisions. This sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to feel like an adult again. But that's what I had to do. And right before going to bed, an email came in, like my old email, or email. It was an email from some random Swedish guy. And it said, uh, hi, uh, I'm a random Swedish guy. Uh, and uh, I just want you to know that I will never know. I've been using it for about two months, and it's totally changed my life, and been being better organized and happier, and it's the, the greatest thing ever. And I felt slightly better. Because, you know, I felt like, oh, you can make like a random speech guy happy to accomplish something. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then he went on to say in his email, uh, so I'm just writing, to, I'm just wondering if you guys are looking for any investment. And so I wrote back at like 3, 10 a.m. I was like, why well, yes? <laughs> you are looking for investment. Uh, and I didn't go to sleep, and I stayed up, and 20 minutes later, we were on a Skype call. Uh, and about two weeks after that, he wired his half million dollars. Uh, and it, that was what it took to basically see us for like the next six or nine months until we actually had enough traction and demonstrated and had a number where all of a sudden, you know, everyone in Silicon Valley wanted to invest in us. Uh, and even, like, even there, it came down to a like, user savings, right? It came down to us making something for us, making something we really love, even though it wasn't perfect, really imperfect, but it was, it was great. It wasn't good yet, but it was already great. Uh, and lots of people also fall in love with it, and some of those people having, happening to have lots of money and poor investment judgment, uh, <laughs> and being able to get in touch with us uh, and, and invest. Um, and actually, both before and after that, we've never taken a penny of money at ever of all of our investors. We've taken 300 something million dollars now into the investment. Uh, all of it comes from investors, even the very late stage ones that are passionate users of the product. Um, and I don't think we could have gotten anywhere as far if we hadn't focused on that. Um, so the, 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 the main lesson that I, that I learned from that was uh, uh, always air to go from Swedish trees. It's just a key. If, I, if you learn nothing else from this talk, it's a good one. So uh, when I think back now to uh, what were the biggest mistakes uh, that, I, that I made personally in my personal life and, and, and my business life? What were some of the biggest mistakes that we made at Evernote? Uh, and thinking about the product, what were some of the, the biggest mistakes when we had features or other decisions and all that kind of stuff? Uh, there's basically one pattern that really emerged. There's one pattern in, in my thinking that I think led to most of the mistakes. And, and, and uh, uh, this is probably the main thing that I would want to tell myself in that time machine. Which is this. Um, humans have a really big negativity bias. Uh, this is pretty well established in lots of different, lots of different ways, but basically it comes up to this. You sound smarter when you say something negative than when you say something positive. You sound smarter when you criticize something than when you praise it. Uh, it you know, bad news travels this way. Um, it's, it's stickier, it's more difficult. Um, there's all sorts of reasons for this. There's, uh, you know, there's sort of cognitive science reasons, which in a very, really, really simplified and not particularly scientifically accurate way, you can think of a sort of the lizard brain uh, hypothesis, right, where you've got portions of portions of our brain, like the amygdala, which handle sort of the fight or flight reactions, are really wired in because they're evolutionary, very old uh, and, and, and deeply connected. Whereas, you know, some of, some of our higher cognitive functions that handle strategy and language and things like that are much younger. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons for it, but basically, we have this vast negativity bias. 
And uh, when, um, when we make decisions, uh, we fool ourselves into thinking that we're comparing the, the, the pros and cons of something. So let's say we have two options. Let's say, like, did you ever know we went through this with uh, uh, our logo? You know, we just, we were, we were making our logo, we had a few different designs, and one was an element, and there was two other very generic designs. And, uh, uh, you know, we're trying to compare uh, to make a decision, so we pretended that we were comparing the pluses and minuses of each, of each logo. But when you do that, what you're really doing is only looking at the minuses, only looking at the downside, because of the negativity bias. It's a very strong negativity bias. And the more people in a room, the worse it gets, because then the herd instinct kicks in, everyone's trying to go smarter than the next person, uh, everyone kind of crosses their arms and kind of goes like this, it just says, like, asinine stuff. Uh, but it all sounds pretty good, because it's mostly negative. And so, you know, we're on the table talking about the logo, and, and, and the, about the elephant one, we heard stuff like, oh, yeah, we can't make it an elephant because, uh, you know, elephants are big and bulky, and so if our logo is an elephant, people will think that we're like big and bulky. Somebody else said, well, we can't make an elephant because uh, elephants are sacred in India, so we would be offending all Indian people. <laughs> and somebody else said, oh, we can't make an elephant because uh, there was a company in the 80s that sold floppy drives, uh, floppy disks, whose symbol was an elephant, and people would think that we made floppy disks. Uh, all sorts of kind of like random reasons for, for why not do it. Uh, but this happens in every decision. When you're trying to compare positives to negatives, you're really comparing negatives to negatives. And you wind up making a decision that isn't the most good, but that's the least bad. Uh, and making decisions that are the least bad is exactly the wrong thing to do if you're trying to be a startup. Right? Because your job as a startup is not to be safe, it's not to mitigate risk, it's not to reduce the chances of failure, it's just to increase the chance of being sharply excellent. So you have to force yourself to make decisions based on what's the most good, not what's the least bad. And the only way to do that is to, well, the only way that, that actually works for me is just to literally force yourself to only look at the positive outcomes and, and decide based on what's the most good. So if we're deciding what product to work on, uh, don't think, well, what happens if we screw it up? Think, like, well, what does the world look like if, if, if it's super awesome? Instead of asking, like, what happens if it goes bad, ask what happens if it's great. And make the choice based on what the best of the greatest outcomes are. Knowing full well that you're not just for risk, and maybe you're more likely to fail, but as a startup, your job is to fail pretty quickly and get out of the way and do something else, or make something important, make something worth changing. And uh, I think I understand that slightly better now than, than in my first company or my second company or even whatever else. Uh, but uh, that would be the most important. So anyway, so uh, now I am uh, no longer the CEO of Evernote, I'm now the executive chairman. Uh, I decided, uh, I've been talking for a while at Evernote about how we're building a 100 year startup. You know, we want to make a company that outlasts the people in it, but still making innovative stuff in 100 years. And a big part of that is, is assembling the right team. And uh, you know, a couple of years ago I realized that I didn't, like, I wanted somebody to come in that was more passionate about running a company at scale, and I wanted to focus on the, the earlier stage uh, puzzles. So we look for a CEO, we made the transition, and uh, I am super happy uh, at this point to be spending most of my time being a partner at Channel Catalyst, uh, which is, to be honest with you, kind of a Goldilocks ideal job for me. Like, I still can't quite believe that this is the opportunity that I have, because it lets me do exactly what I want to do, which is uh, work with small teams of highly brilliant nerds, walk through walls together, be there at the moment of inception, create something awesome, uh, and, and, and solve, solve the early problems, the inception problems, the scaling problems. And uh, that's really what I do. So I really hope to be able to, to, to work with any of you here uh, that have those kinds of conditions. Um, I said, I want to end with this, that uh, when we started Evernote, we took advantage, we got really lucky, we took advantage of this platform opportunity, right? So we were starting it just as smartphones were getting really big and all of the new platforms launched, and we were always in our staff on these platforms. And uh, for the past three or four years, that, that opportunity hasn't been there. Um, I think it's back. And if any of you are making companies, um, I, I, I think this opportunity is back. But it's not an apps anymore. I actually think apps are kind of dead at this point. Uh, I think the next platform opportunity is in uh, things like conversational UX, conversational user experiences, uh, and, uh, and AI. 
I think lots of things are going to start happening over the next couple of years. Lots of new things launching, like the Amazon Echo being an early example, and Siri and stuff. And Google's coming out with being great examples, and Slack, which is going to be launching, you know, app stores and all of the other uh, messaging and chat clients, which are going to open up and have APIs. That is, in my mind, the next the next app opportunity. I think bots are the new apps. And when I look at some of the new stuff now, like when I when I held a uh, um, the Amazon Echo in my hands for the first time a couple of months ago, and I kind of interacted with it, kind of stupid as it was. Uh, I had the same kind of moment as I did when I, when I first held that iPhone in 2007. Like, I saw that screen, I saw all the lights go green. And I could like, see the next five years, I think, of, of, of where this industry is going to go. And I think the next several multi-million dollar companies are going to be created doing things in conversational UXs and AI, basically reinventing how we interact with technology in a much more natural way. So uh, I'm hoping to be able to participate in, invest in, uh, help nurture uh, several companies that come after Evernote that do this. Thank you very much. I'm an eternal optimist, and uh, I tend to look at the positive, but there are, as, with a, with a great, I mean, your, your story's inspirational, but I think for every story that you have, there's probably a hundred others who are just as optimistic that didn't get as lucky as you. So how do you balance being, being uh, that optimist that sees the positive and wants to maximize the good, uh, while, while being realistic and minimizing potential risk? Uh, well, what risk? Uh, I mean, seriously, so obviously luck plays a huge part of this. I think anyone who's had any measure of success has also been lucky. Like, I don't think there's any company or person out there that is, is successful in any way that can be like, no, luck has nothing to do with this, I earned this. Like, luck is always a major uh, percentage, a major player. And there are lots of people who are super hardworking and very smart and just don't get the breaks and aren't, aren't successful. So, of course, that's, that's a true statement. But the question is for you, if you're in this room, uh, what is risk? Uh, I think risk is wasting your time. Risk is like wasting your life. Risk is like not doing something that you think actually has a chance to move the world in a positive direction. Like, that's the risk. Like, the only real cost is opportunity cost. And I mean that in a literal way. It's not like starting in, a, in a, an interesting startup and then having it fail because if you got unlucky, it's bad for you in any way. It's no penalty for failure. Like you're still just as employable as you ever were, if not probably more so. You made great relationships, great contacts. You usually get paid a little bit. That's why there's people like us that are investors that actually give you money to pursue something crazy. And when we're investing, we're not looking for something safe. Right? As a VC, I'm not looking for you to lose my money slowly. Right? I'm looking for you to have a small chance to make a massive impact. And I know there's a small chance, but I know that we'll probably never see that money again. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of risk to you other than doing some bullshit thing because you happen to think that it's safe and 20 years later saying, man, I wish I had that time machine. Uh, so yeah, very small chance of actual success as an entrepreneur. Uh, very small chance of like massive financial success, but Doing something that you can feel good about that has high impact is, is almost a certainty if that's how you approach it.
So the real question isn't like, how do you, how do you make something that nobody else will want? The real question is like, what is the level of investment that's appropriate for your idea? Like not everything is a venture uh, scale idea. There's plenty of products that maybe only 50,000 people could really love, and that's probably just not the sort of thing that you would go to a VC for. But it could be the sort of thing that you could work on and be really happy and make really good money. So uh, I wouldn't start with, how do I come up with an idea that's big enough to be able to get VC money? I would start with, what do I want to do? And then actually think about what the size of that is, and if it happens to be big enough where the right move is to raise you know, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, of course, you can do that. But if the right move is to take out a loan or, or, or do a different level of financing, just be happy in that, in that job, then that's appropriate uh, as well. Basically, I think like the product market fit, there's, like, there's two things that I think are kind of shift that people talk a lot about in startup now. Product market fit, which is just like people say, like, oh, we didn't find the right product market fit. Uh, what does that mean? It just means your product sucked. Like, the bad fit is that it sucked. And if it had been good, like, it would have been a great fit. Um, and then the other one is the IPD, minimal viable product, which is, I think, in the consumer facing world, just, I couldn't disagree with this idea that you would want to, like, ship the minimum viable product is, it just seems like a bad idea because there's already a thousand more viable products than yours in whatever category you want to do. Uh, if anything, you should be looking for not the MVP, but I don't know if we thought about it as the, the MVP, the, the minimal, the minimum awesome product. Like what is the least you could do to make it awesome? Not awesome in everything, but like awesome in one particular thing. Uh, and then you should have that. And if you make it for yourself, you can get to the minimal awesome product much faster because you'll be able to, to iterate it much more. So if you have an idea for a product that you think you would really love to lose yourself, but you honestly think it's not big enough to, to, to make this company, like I want to hear, it. I've never actually heard an actual idea like that. I've heard the concern about that, but no one's actually said like, so here's what I'm thinking, and I would really love this, but I don't know if it's a product, you're like, okay, and then you would like, explain it to you, like, yeah, yeah, you're the only person in the world that would want to that. Like, I've never actually heard that idea, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Here we go. Great, thank you so much.